What's going on guys, it's Kofi Bowen. and in today's video we're actually going to talk about how to use YouTube to aid your filmmaking. As freelancers and creators coming up, using YouTube, at least in my experience, has done a lot to actually generate a lot more revenue and also being able to give me some opportunity and flexibilities to say no to jobs that I don't want to do. Now, any of you guys starting out, this is just my experience. I can't really be an expert here. I'm still actually working on it, but there might be some useful tips that could help you. There you go. All right, so that's going to be the first thing I'm going to talk about. I'm going to try to answer questions, but at the same time, keep on track with what I want to explain. Uh, what are you hoping to see in the FX6 Mark II? Fix the audio top handle, give us some downsampling, and if you want to give us OCN Raw LT, I'll be happy. But generally speaking, outside of that, just make the workflow easier. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is kind of like why YouTube and kind of breaking down what, the, what I've learned in the last about two years of kind of doing, a year and a half of doing YouTube. Um, Basically, what ends up happening for me and, and the kind of my workflows, I work a lot in the fitness industry. I've worked a lot with like supplement companies and different influencers and athleisure companies and stuff like that. And to be honest, it's a great way to have really cool stuff for your reel. Uh, it's a great way to have a lot of work, but it also doesn't pay a stupid amount of money. You actually still have to do other things and work other projects in order to keep the fitness thing up. Now, one of the things I ended up doing was I would take on like weddings or I would also add photo into the mix or I would do other things. I kept adding on and adding on extra work just to make up what like a regular commercial DP would make on a project. And what ends up happening is I'm doing three, four times the work, but I'm not getting paid nearly as much for actual thing about that project. Now, one of the things I tried to do was get better at cinematography. So I learned a lot about lighting and camera movement and lenses. And that helped scale the pricing up a little bit because my work looked different, but it still wasn't that much compared to when I worked at things outside of the fitness space. So basically what I tried to do is find different ways that are a little bit lower effort, but still kind of made up the difference in terms of what I wanted. And uh, that's when YouTube started to come up. Now, that's not to say that you can just jump into YouTube and right away you are able to start making up the finances that you would have had uh, to make up the difference in your freelance life. You still have to do a lot of work, but using YouTube after a year and being patient and creating these videos um, has actually been able to give me a couple of opportunities. One, there's obviously the financial side of it, right? We talk about things like sponsorships and affiliate marketing, what we'll get into, and um, doing things like live streams, sometimes there's super chats or whatever, um, or anything like that, anything in that realm where YouTube is monetizable, um, selling digital products and stuff. And the combination of that, so for example, if I did a fitness video and it was a thousand bucks, but like what it would have cost outside of that industry would have been like $3,000. If I have digital products that are already on the go or courses or I have a sponsored video or whatever the case might be, I might be able to use that to offset what I would have had, like what I would have wanted to make doing the project on its own. And then I can create content that lasts indefinitely, essentially. And then people can either go and buy the product that you're promoting because you use it on that shoot or it's a product that you keep in your kit. Um, or you have that course where you could teach other people to do the same. So now they're buying into it as well. So that's kind of how you can use that. But I want to talk about how you can start into YouTube and like what things you might want to think about um, to make things a little bit easier. Actually, my question about was a while ago. I do have doubts, but I really still love it so much. And I've been using it. It's just my main camera right now. So sure, it provides everything I need. Uh, if if the I'm not sure if you have, do you have doubts about the camera or do you have doubts in skill set? Like what things, like if it's doing everything you need, what are the things that you're, that you have doubts about, I guess would be my next question uh, regarding to the, uh, the FX30 stuff. Now, before I get started, because I, I kind of made notes, but at the same time, I left it up to you guys to kind of ask questions in the community chat. Uh, I'm going to answer some of the questions first, and then I'll kind of go through what my rationale or at least the workflow that I use YouTube for. So we're going to go over to community. And there was 10 whole questions that were asked, which is not a ton, but it is what it is. Um, how to get clients when you're first starting out. So I actually have a video about that coming up in the next couple of weeks. I batched a bunch of it, um, all about like kind of starting over while well, I'm gonna use a Sony FX30 for a little bit, then I'm gonna show a bunch of skills that you can learn on the FX30, then I'm gonna upgrade to the three. I'm gonna skip the six because we've done it already. I'm not gonna get the nine, but if Mark IIs come out, that all goes out the window. But essentially what I wanna do is build the foundation of 
things that I learned freelancing. So when the new and the more expensive stuff comes out, there isn't so much of a question of how you got there. All of those things are going to be taught already. So you could always reference back to it. And then you can use those methods and techniques to actually get the things that you want to get if you see them on YouTube, or um, if you want to earn some extra money and there's stuff you might not know. Uh, the thing with cameras now is that like they're so accessible that you could jump the gun and get a camera that could do like 4k 10 bit but then not know to have contracts on a shoot so i'm trying to bridge that gap a little bit and also help people that are watching this stuff as freelancers uh, but essentially how you get clients is you figure out the problem that you're trying to solve right like for example if i want to go get groceries the problem is i'm hungry the problem that's being solved in the grocery store is i have food that you can buy you can make or whatever the case is you'll eat it you're no longer hungry and solving that problem has a certain uh monetary value to it now the same thing is going to work with video so for me personally when i'm working with um, fitness companies, whatever the case might be, they need certain types of content in order to solve a problem that they have, either be lead generation or leads or different things, right? And they'll attribute a financial goal to that. So um, one of the gigs I have on, what day is it today? I'm leaving on in November, I'm going to Montreal, and I shoot ads for a company called Blue Star. They have their own channel as well. They're a really big supplement company, mostly, uh, and they're in the States a lot more than they are in Canada, despite the fact that it's a Canadian company. But um, we do ad shoots every single month, like we, we uh, sometimes multiple times a month, where they do a lot of Facebook and Google ads. And uh, I'm shooting a lot of those Facebook and Google ads and having a really high volume and high quality images. And then I get that stuff to them. Um, on off, sometimes I'll end up doing like some docs for them as well. And sometimes some of their YouTube content as well. But essentially, the problem we're trying to solve is using social media to generate sales, right? So with that, you need a ton of content in order to do that. So you want to keep that in mind. So as long as you're solving a problem for a company or a business, business, you're able to put a dollar amount on that. And when they want to solve it, well, they're going to have to pay you. Dang, I'm late. <laughs> Lock and shake. Yeah, this guy's out here. He's oh, you're, in, you're in everything, man. Much respects to you. Uh, you know what it is. You know what we're talking about. Uh, I guess was the low like abilities, but surely I will learn to cope with it over time. I guess doubts come because of the creator. Oh, sorry. That's my first um, person. Uh, don't worry too much about it, man. I mean, like, the thing with cameras is that like you don't like there's certain things you don't necessarily need to worry about if they're not going to happen. I mean like yes, the smaller sensor camera isn't going to be a 12,000 ISO camera that's on a full frame sensor, but then at the same time you'd be really surprised about how usable it actually is. Um, I also, if you're not in a lot of low light scenarios and you don't have control over your set, like you're not in that situation where you have a ton of uh, stuff you're shooting in the dark and you, I don't know, if you're not in those situations, I wouldn't worry about them. It's kind of like not wanting to drive get a driver's license if you don't want to accidentally become a nascar racer if you don't find yourself in those extremes then you don't necessarily need to worry about the tool that you have that needs to be used in those extremes because you're not in those extremes i hope that made sense um no camera and lens look uh combination can replace good location great talent great costume great makeup yeah absolutely right you can you can totally do a lot of things if you pay attention to your set design and your production um and i think those like i think that's a really good thing and i think that's also a really important thing to remember for a lot of stuff um but i think in the beginning a lot of people don't know how to location scout finding talent costume gaffer grip and stuff like that like when you're just starting you're usually by yourself um and you learn a lot of the, at least me i learned a lot of those things later on as i develop my own skill set i'm able to lean on others to help with that so as much as those are important you still have to start somewhere because you might um get the analysis by or the paralysis by over analysis by them being by there's being so many things right and a lot of people starting out in camera like it's easy to buy a camera and learn those things by yourself you have those control of uh, you have control over those variables but like that mean that doesn't mean that those things are not important it just you got to work your way up into them right like if i'm someone who's getting a fx30 or a6700 and just learning how to shoot small videos i shouldn't be worrying about like when am i going to get a gaffer for my next project at least in my opinion but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's not a very valuable point um is there a balance between your self content creation uh so the balance between self content creation outreach paid work in terms of hours of management so the the way that i kind of do it is what and what was nice for me is like i freelanced a ton before i got into youtube i didn't do a lot of them at the same time but what i did was um 
I augmented a lot of my lifestyle to make sure that I can grow the YouTube business just like if I was growing anything else. So like I lived in an apartment that was like three times as big and three times as much a year ago and I moved to a much smaller thing. I spent a lot less money. So I didn't feel that FOMO of like taking a client gig that might have sounded like a lot of money because I needed to pay my like a ton of expenses versus the amount of work I had to do. But then at, also at the same time, like uh, and this kind of goes into where YouTube starts. At the very beginning, like you're going to suck at making videos, like even people as video producers, I think we know more than most people, like most freelance videographers know more than most people making YouTube videos, but that doesn't negate the fact that our first videos, a lot of them are going to suck. Like, and sorry, that was a, that was an alarm. But um, if you go farther back into kind of my back catalog compared to now, like I am terrible at YouTube. I, I talk really fast. Uh, some of the topics I cover aren't really relevant, at least for the time and stuff like that. So you tow that line of like, you still are starting a new business, but you just have more experience doing YouTube. So at the beginning, your time management might be swung a little bit where keep the best clients you have, keep the highest paying stuff that you have. And then some of that smaller stuff, don't necessarily give it up yet. Like you don't want to, I don't know, it's kind of tough. You don't want to lose a ton of money, but give yourself enough time to grow that second business because I'm telling you from like just in a year and a half of doing this, like there are client jobs I don't even read the emails to unless it's a certain amount because I could quite literally say this video is sponsored by Squarespace and that would make up the cost of that or the revenue that I would have made doing a whole client project. So um, in terms of how do you manage your time, uh, do what you like, it depends on the person, right? Do what you kind of can. Like if you have a busy freelance schedule, then I would say honor that, especially if it's paying your bills. Um, but if you have the ability to etch out, even if you put out like a video a month, that's still better than than not putting one up at all. Um, then we'll talk about kind of things and kind of ideas that you can use uh, to help you out a little bit more. Oh no, no worries, man. Like I find with live streams, uh, they're a lot of fun because it takes me an hour and a half. Once it's done, it's done. Uh, I get to communicate with you guys and like, um, I'm still on this kick and this is my overall mentality when you start making YouTube videos is like I you guys obviously like you guys have seen a lot of my videos but you don't see a lot of finished projects a lot of finished work and I don't feel like posting that stuff just yet not necessarily from a lack of confidence but I don't feel like I've put out enough value where it's so much that it's irresponsible not to watch uh, and I find that sometimes if I put out more of myself and more of myself kind of flexing my skill set rather than explaining to you guys how you can flex yours it feels a bit more selfish at least in my opinion where i want to put out more value so when i do a short film or a documentary or anything like that like you're more inclined to watch it because the person that is put it out gave you so much free game to begin with uh that's real i tried to vlog my dji pocket and it was kind of trash man so uh one of the big things i was going to say when you're starting out as a freelancer into going to youtube understand that the you might know the video things of the, uh, you might know the video side of things you might know how to compose you might know camera settings you might know filtration and working with log and color grading one thing that you might not be prepared for is the performance aspect of it and that's a big thing for a lot of people in video production when they go into youtube is that that's a skill set that you start off not good at because no one does unless you've been doing it for a while and um that's one of the things that might that stop a lot of people from from making YouTube videos. They either don't like the sound of their voice, or they talk too slow, or you're like me and you talk too fast. Um, you go through some of those things where you have to like see your own personal weaknesses. Whereas being in video production, like you can you can hide a weakness, like you can you could uh, hide away uh, cracks in your skill set, or learn more things quicker, or hire someone else to do it. But there isn't a YouTube tutorial for personality, so it is really hard to watch at first. Um, I would say like when you're starting out, just make a couple of videos, just talking to the camera with simple cuts and, and start off there. Right. And you'll slowly ramp yourself up. No one really remembers the first video you made, but they'll remember the last one. If that makes any sense. Uh, I don't know if I got that analogy, right. But, uh, most people won't be like, Hey, remember that video you put out in 2018? It sucked. They're going to be like, remember that last video you put out? That was super helpful. Right. So even if it sucks, I would just get the ball rolling and let, you don't really know how good a piece of content is until the audience sees it. So even videos I didn't think was going to do well, I just put them out and then let things happen. You're totally right. Just to people keep in mind because the beginning is shouldn't worry about this. Yeah, people definitely do get stuck in the camera lens matrix. And I think that's what I'm trying to like 
um, still give the information in case they encounter that type of gear, but at the same time, like baby steps certain things and make sure that they don't forget them. But I like again, it has to, there has to be some sort of jump off point um, that ever like people have to understand, right? If you throw too much stuff at somebody, they're not going to know their heck from their ass. They're going to they're going to do a small business commercial and think that they're going to need a, a producer, and then they're not going to like they're going to not necessarily not need a producer, but like they're going to think they need more things than they actually do. That is just as worrisome as making that gear all the time. Like you could just you could be just as dangerous hiring and doing all this other stuff outside of camera and lens, thinking that those are more important, and then find out that those things aren't even important. That it's just it's just nice to have a skill set and gear that works for you. Um, how often do you feel, how do you feel about the panel lights from Emily and like Godox hand looks like from space? Uh, yeah, use whatever works, man. I think if you can find a way to diffuse panels, then, uh, you're, you're, in, you're in good sorts, right? Like I'm using a panel light from Falcon eyes right now, and it's only about like, like that thick, uh, it fits on the desk and it works pretty well. So I've been using that for YouTube since, since I moved here, which was like last October. So it does, it does do pretty well. I think any sort of. Uh, panel light that you can diffuse does and goes a really long way. Um, so as far as I've put the 15 videos and it seems impossible to grow, it feels short of. So this is where I'm gonna story 11. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a stat and this might encourage you or it might really get on your nerves. Um, I was talking to Roberto Blake and I don't know if you guys know him very well, but he does a lot of stuff in terms of how to grow on YouTube. Um, and I talked to him pretty frequently and we were talking about like how many videos it takes uh, to really grow or like where to kind of expect growth from. Um, and he gave me a stat and it's essentially two things. One, the effort output difference between somebody at 100,000 subscribers and a million isn't actually super, super far from each other. Um, and then also the average channel on YouTube that has 100,000 subscribers is about 700, which is insane to me because like this year I've put out just about a hundred videos. I'm at like 91. And, uh, that's a lot of, that's a lot of content. Um, what I would say is I wouldn't necessarily matter so much about growth because you can't control it, but I would worry about the output and how many times they're showing up to bat because that's a far easier thing to control. Um, and it's also like, it's, it's much easier of a benchmark, right? Like I can't control how many people watch a video. It's impossible. I wish I could, but I can't, but I can control the fact that I'm going to put out a hundred videos a year until otherwise. And those are things that you want to kind of focus on rather than how many views or how many subscribers you have. Focus on what you're doing because those are the things that you can control. Uh, did you get yo, did you get the new beta firmware for the Komodo X? I'm having a hard time figuring out new user pages. I have not. Uh, I haven't got it for the Komodo X. Uh, I've been actually been doing a ton of stuff on the FX30 for the last little bit. So my KX I haven't used since the update came out, which I think was a week ago. Um, I had shot... A project on it a week and a half ago so it came out like a couple days after the last thing i shot so i'm like i'm not in a rush to do it but i do have a doc i have to shoot on sunday on sunday uh so i probably do have to do that at some point in time um i feel like if i was to make a curriculum right now go out the window because so many questions are coming in so i'm just going to keep answering questions uh how do you run ads and convert into clients um i don't run ads for any i've never run ads for anything from a videographer perspective or a youtube perspective as well um one thing that i would recommend doing especially when you're starting out and i'm, I'm going to work on a product that i could kind of make to, to do this um i want to make an outreach pack like an outreach pack that has like email templates uh, social media DM templates, stuff you could text your friends and family um, and, and things like that. And one thing I also really want to work on is, um, and I'm going to put it actually in a video coming up on Monday, is uh, actually sending a video business card to your friends and family. And it can be as simple as me just talking like this and saying like, hey, uh, my name is Kofi Boa. I run a video production company. I am starting to take on new clients. Right now we are an emerging company. We're looking for new people to work with. And if you have and you wanna send this to anybody in your network, send them this video instead of a website link because now you can see exactly what it looks like when you're working with me. See you guys later and thank you. Honestly, that works perfectly fine. Um, I actually want to do that and give that as a suggestion. So that way, instead of being like sending this DM template or whatever, you send a video instead, because if you're in the video business, people want to see video. Um, the same thing with like, if you're in the fitness business, people want to know you're in shape, kind of the same thing. Oh, okay, good. That's encouraging. Cause when I heard that, uh, initially the number was 440 in terms of, uh, 
getting to 100,000 subscribers. So I'm like, cool, I can make 100, uh, 440 videos. I'll just do 200 a, a year or something like that. And then when he told me it was closer to seven, I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, well, <laughs> we'll try our best, I guess. But um, no, I think one of my big things is I'm super committed to like putting up as many videos and almost, I want to run out of ideas. And I feel like I haven't felt like I've run out of ideas. I haven't run out of ideas for a long time. So I want to make sure that I, I kind of wring the towel in terms of how much stuff I can make. Because I, at least personally for me, I think it's valuable to people watching. So video business card totally makes sense for video production. Way more professional than cold email. Honestly, man, like I used to be a – like I'm going to tell you kind of a weird hustler story. So working in a lot of fitness and stuff, they have things like the Arnold Classic and the Olympia. One sec. <clears throat> the Arnold Classic and the Olympia. And what they did was all the fitness expos had a list of all of the um, the vendors that were there. So what I used to do is I bought an iPad and I put all of my videos on this iPad. And then I sent emails to every vendor that was there. And instead of putting a website, I attached a video with a couple different uh, so I can do booth event recaps because I was going to the expo anyways. And it would take me like 45 minutes to shoot, maybe an hour to edit it. And I was just making money while I was there, and uh, it made it, it made, like I did pretty decently. I paid the whole trip off, right? But stuff like that that are a little more um, personal uh, works out very well because everybody gets emails that are trying to sell you something. Everybody gets a DM trying to sell you something. But like when you get a personalized video, it does far differently. It feels a little bit different. It feels like the person's talking to you rather than the company is talking to you, which is a very special thing, especially when you're a solo operator starting out. Um, what tools do you use to organize structure your talking points to stay on track in videos? I'm going to be so honest with you, bro, in terms of uh, workflow for my YouTube videos. I have notes on my phone. Maybe they're in point form. Maybe they're not. Uh, that's about it. And also, I sometimes don't script. Uh, I, I sometimes don't script anything at all. So if it's a topic that I know very well or if I'm recapping something that happened, Generally, I don't really have a script for it, but if it's something where like I need to remember stats or uh, specs for a camera or something like that, then I'll, I will write those things down. Um, but yeah, those are those are kind of things I would uh, I would do. Now, if you're getting into the gear uh, side of YouTube, which honestly love it or hate it, I, I'm going to explain some of the income streams about YouTube a little bit later on. But it is a really good way to make money, especially if they're things that you use, something you generally stand behind. Um, you might want to have some sort of like a checklist that you go over to cover certain topics about certain types of products because at the end of the day like lenses are lenses cameras are cameras uh, lights are lights and that kind of things and you want to have kind of like benchmarks that you look for in each one what was that fellow that knows all these youtube growth stats again would love to see more uh roberto blake so roberto blake is uh he knows that he has a lot. He used to do a lot of live streams, or I think he still does actually. I think he's doing one like right now. Um, Roberto Blake is really good at explaining how like YouTube growth and stuff like that, more from a general perspective and not necessarily just for filmmakers. But um, it's a really good resource to look at when you want to know how things work. In fact, like during the pandemic, I would watch three hour live streams that he'd have like every Sunday. And I would say that would that would taught me the most about like learning the back end of some of the YouTube numbers. Uh, were you always good at public speaking, or did it develop with practice? Um, I, de I was pretty decent. Like I'm, I'm, I, I would what you're. I'm probably the more outgoing side of people on social media, especially like in the filmmaking space. I, I do think that I'm more of an outgoing person, uh, so I use that to my advantage in some of these videos and stuff like that. But one of the problems I had was because I was so eager to share information. Um, <laughs> I would talk too fast. So uh, one of the things that uh, was funny because I, I did a video with Mark Bowen. We actually did a course about this, and I'm going to his office now to actually do a follow up. Um, he would say like, "Hey, man, you like it's great that you're getting a lot of information. It's awesome, but you talk really fast, so people that like aren't English speakers are going to have a problem." So um, with anything, even if you have a talent for it, you still need to grow the skill a little bit, right? So you could you could have a ton of uh, things you're really good at, but you still need to work on them. I recommend looking at into brand strategy. It's very important not only to apply your own brand. Yeah, the brand strategy is definitely a thing that you want to look at as well. Um, I think that is for if you're looking for like that's also going to be the uh, the end goal of solving problems. Um, 
is when you're looking into the, uh, the strategy of that brand. And I think when you are freelancing and you're doing it outside of YouTube, one of the things you want to look at brand strategy is your own. So what, um, what things about your personal brand and style of filmmaking is going to be something that you want to tell a lot of people. So for example, like I shoot a ton of fitness stuff and like Cam has entered the chat. So he is uh, very much someone who is a, um, a filmmaker around indigenous culture and, and Western fashion and fashion in general and stuff like that. So even when I'm teaching the gear or how to shoot or the settings, it's all within that type of context. So people that resonate with that type of content or people that want to learn, know your branding for a particular thing that it, that you do. And then also seek that value, like they see that value from you as well. So you kind of hit two birds with one stone. Um, if Red Little X was an anime, which anime would it be? Um, I'm going to say either JJK or Attack on Titan, which I think they're both MAPPA animes. And just because Studio MAPPA is a really good uh, animation studio and they're super expensive. So um, the Red Komodo X has great image quality and it's very expensive. So it would be any Studio MAPPA anime ever. Had the same problem talking too fast, except I was often nervous talker. Can't say that improved a lot. No, Mike, I've watched your channel. That's a lie. Uh, so you have improved a lot. Um, I hope he's a cool kid at YouTuber events, Mr. Popular over here. I'm definitely not. I'm definitely that weird kid um, that is there. And people are asking why I am <laughs> sitting down with this monopod. Hang on a second. Cam, Cam was here for this and anybody else at Condo. I ran around with this monopod in my Sony FX30 making reels pretty much for the entire trip. Uh, I would post up in the hotel lobby. I would take whatever gear that was in the closet that I could rent out. I'd shoot something with it, run right back, make an Instagram reel, and like post it on the day. So I, I think I was like the first person uh, about the A7C Mark II because I uh, legitimately shot stuff outside, ran upstairs, recorded a reel, edited it on my laptop, and exported it, put it on my phone, and put it on Instagram like right away. Uh, are you currently running a custom LUT on this live stream? If so, how? Uh, yeah, okay, so I'm trying not to plug the FX30, but it's really cool that I can do this. The FX3 can do it too. But um, you can still put lot, like LUTs onto your camera and then run it as a webcam utility as well with the new firmware update. So right now it's still like it's using the webcam utility, but I'm shooting in S-Log with the LUT that I already have in my camera on top of it. Uh, it's obviously going to bake it in because it's just recording whatever the screen is recording from my my uh, camera. But yeah, you could you could totally do that. You could totally use LUTs there, um, and I'm using my own. So if you want them, you can click the link in the description down below. Um, I'm going to try my best to get through all of the questions before I talk about kind of like a, a workflow or a timeline. Um, can you use? Can you stream from a, the Atomos Engine Five? Uh, you can, I think. I've never actually tried, Andre, so I don't know. I don't want to steer you the wrong direction. I think you can. Um, I would check. Caleb Pike has a video on live streaming, so on like a live streaming setup. So it does. Um, I think it does work. Mm. Or you can. Oh, sorry. Okay, I, sorry. There was a thing messaging. Or you can live stream to Ninja Five. You can. You totally can. I just find this easier because it's just a USB C cable. Um, Maybe off topic, do you think there is any benefit to owning more than one system? I have a Canon and a Sony. You sports photography, you sports video, and the FX30. Oh, Jesus. You have a lot of stuff. Um, Charles, maybe. Like, I, I, it super depends. Like, it depends on where you are landscape wise. So, for example, like living in Toronto and stuff like that, when I wanted to go, like, I have, I have multiple systems technically. I have a Red and I have a Sony. Um, the red is for like larger projects. If I want to put into a rental house or if I want to be a camera operator on production, like stuff like that, that are away from jobs that I would have done on like a Sony mirrorless camera, then definitely it's a benefit to have both of those things. Um, but if you're someone that's very much solo, actually, no, buy whatever tool you want. Uh, if the Canon colors and the Canon photography is what you love, keep it. Uh, if the Sony video is what you like, keep it. I don't think it actually makes a difference. I'm going to walk back what I was about to say, but realistically buying the tools that you want also means you could have whatever camera body and system you want. You just need to have multiple lenses. Um, I'm going to try to get to question number three on this 10 question on the community post. Uh, in terms of earning from YouTube, are you 
asking companies for gear, buying gear, then asking them to pay for the creating video, or both, et cetera. Um, this was asked by Luke Phipps. Um, so going into, I, I guess we're going to start with the gear part of YouTube. And like, and as much as the technique and the the filmmaking side of YouTube are videos that should that are a little bit lacking and should be more out there, the gear stuff being completely objective about it from a business standpoint, it's what people search for the most. It's what people stay for the most. Um, also, it's far easier to monetize. So if you are looking to kind of pad your stats financially, that's that's where things are going to go. I'm not saying that you have to make YouTube videos about camera gear, but I am saying that in terms of the through lines to monetize on it, it is far easier using it for things that people can tangibly buy and have much sooner than me teaching you a skill set that you still have to practice. Um, it is what it is. But anyways, um, in terms of working with different brands and stuff like that on the channel, I, there's certain there's a certain level and like stepping stones that I went through uh, in order to get the things that I wanted. So uh, initially, what would end up happening was I would just review stuff that I already purchased and I already knew and those things because I, I still use the, like I use them all the time, right? Like I didn't just necessarily buy gear to make YouTube reviews, but um, when I as a freelancer and we're all freelancing, I'm assuming, or we're all working in filmmaking, we're all doing um, that sort of thing you would just review the things that you already have because that might help somebody else. And then also you're just talking about tools that help you. Um, and that's the whole point of it. The entire point of having a YouTube channel is just like doing client projects. You're giving value back to somebody and solving their problems and in exchange or indirectly, they're giving you money. Um, so I reviewed the stuff that I already had, right? Um, some things I wanted to try out, I wanted to experience and I would pay them cost to be the boss and I would buy those things. And if I didn't like it after a couple of months, I'd get rid of it. But or if I need the extra money, but whatever. So starting out, typically the gear that you have bought already probably where's where you want to start. The way that I look at doing YouTube videos for free is the same way that I look at spec work to get new clients. So if I'm going to review the pro like the the gear that I already have, I would then go and find out which companies I'm either interested in what they have or things that I would otherwise buy anyways and use for jobs because I, I needed those tools or I wanted those tools. And I would see if I could strike a deal to either get myself a discount or I could borrow it for the project that's coming up. Uh, and I did that and I would use my old reviews that I paid hard earned money for. And then I'd say like, hey, uh, Irix, uh, I use a 50 millimeter G Master lens. I love that lens and I did a review. Uh, do you wanna send me one of yours? Because I'm looking at buying it. I wanna use it for another project, but we can kind of figure out a deal where we can satisfy both things. I make a video for you and you can make some sales and I have a lens that I need for my next project. And as you go up, what ends up happening as uh, you guys might know if you're in a smaller channel is that you might be able to borrow it. You still have to make the review, but you might not get paid for it. Um, growing, I realize that that's not the most sustainable thing in the world. I can't just borrow gear, whatever, and make all these videos. It takes a long time. Um, so you do borrow things for your next project, and then you use that as collateral again to get paid reviews, right? Or get uh, the product to keep. So you should like, hey, I'm going to make a video that's going to give you a ton of value, and you could uh, negotiate, or necessarily you can argue that – the value that you're going to bring that company based on the success of your previous videos is going to help with sales. What's one lens? I, uh, you know, I'd like to make an exchange. I make the video and I keep the lens. Or lenses. Like I got a set of iron glass lenses that are here. I haven't reviewed them yet and I haven't opened the box. But uh, same kind of deal, right? And then you get whatever the case is. You make the review. You get to keep the lenses. Now you have tools that you can use for your next project. So now this stuff is trying to make – and now this stuff is actually making you money uh, as, as a freelancer because you're not having to pay for gear you otherwise have to pay for. And you're making content and things like affiliate markets uh, are actually growing uh, your finances as well. Uh, and then there's obviously you go a step beyond that. People give you the lenses and they pay you or some combination of the two. Now, one thing that I – one strategy that I use, and again, this is me just being an objective business person, um, gear video makes money uh, a little bit quicker than some of the other stuff unless you're selling courses or other educational products. You don't have to do it, but this is the strategy that I employed. Um, I talked about every single tool that I used all across the board from like – the, I actually had the Canon C200, I think, when I first started talking about YouTube videos or whatever. Um, but everything that I had used up until that point, those were things that I would make reviews and, and dedicated videos about. Uh, and then I would get on things like Amazon affiliates, which is a big thing for a lot of you guys. If you're starting out in um, YouTube filmmaking, I don't care what it is or who it is, uh, Amazon affiliates is incredibly easy to get onto. And uh, that's where people will 
if say for example you put out a short film and someone's really interested in the gear that you use for that uh that's that short film when you buy something from amazon affiliates or bnh and whatever affiliate but affiliate marketing in general um you'll get a kickback every time someone buys something right which makes a lot of sense because when we see stuff we just saw a hollywood movie and we found it was shot on the fx3 everybody in their mom that had the money by an fx3 probably bought an fx3 that pushed them over the edge that's not necessarily in my eyes at least i don't think that's a disingenuous thing you wanted to know the thing that was used they use that thing you bought it um and then if uh gareth edwards or greg frazier got an amazon affiliate account they make a ton of money so uh, those are things that you want to consider looking at whenever you are doing affiliate marketing as as far as youtube goes right so that's one thing that i use quite a bit um in terms of of making enough affiliate money that like that underpaid job that would have only given you like 800 bucks to shoot this event that you have to edit and have to be a same day thing it's a color grade and you have to change the music because clients always do that i've now solved with just doing amazon affiliate marketing and making youtube videos um Another and, and another thing that you can do is, and that's kind of out of your control, is going to be AdSense, where you're going to get paid a certain amount of money for YouTube to run ads on your videos. And the more views that you get, the longer people watch, the more money you get, right? So those are things you want to keep in mind as well. So the combination of just AdSense and affiliates might be something that might have you say no to that small business video that you weren't really into and it's not going to help your portfolio, right? So that's kind of what the strategy is, is that we're trying to just replace the jobs we don't want to do uh, or the jobs that aren't going to feed us from a creative standpoint or sometimes even financially and replace it with something that's a little bit lower effort because honestly, it's easier for me to do a review than it is to do a client shoot uh, and stuff like that. Oh, Andrea, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, y'all hit the like button, bro. We out here giving out like, I'm gonna be here for another at least 45 minutes. My hip hurts. Uh, we're gonna be out here for at least another 45 minutes giving out some free game about uh, I guess whatever I've learned about making YouTube videos and stuff like that. So uh, hit that like button. That'd be awesome if you did uh, and, and cooler if you did too. But um, let's keep moving on. Um, so we talked about affiliate markets. We talked about AdSense. Yeah, I, I don't have a thousand subscribers and still get free privileges from companies. Yeah, man, like Jay, I'm, I'm telling you right now, like as people that are in the video space right now, like you have to think about where the market is, right? The market is right now is that cameras are incredibly uh, accessible, right? Something like the FX30 at like, I think it's like $1,500 now. Like it actually went down in price a bit. Um, is a camera that would have costed you at least $5,000 like four and a half years ago. So you have people that are getting into this, the getting into video production and buying cameras and stuff like that. There's a couple of problems with that. One, people want to know how it's used, right? So if you have that tool, teach people how it's used. For the most part, a lot of you guys love the Sony FX30 content I put out. That solves that problem. Um, the second thing, people want to know what they need to get what they want out of it. Um, and again, you be delicate with this and be objective with it and be careful with it and also understand some responsibility. But then that also means that the accessories that you have that you use with the same tools, you can teach on those things as well um, without being super salesy, but just as a anecdote of, hey, if you're interested in this, this is what experience that I have with it. Um, those are two things that are very, very big. And then the next step for a lot of freelancers after they bought the camera, they bought the lens and the accessories is, okay, well, how do I make money from this thing? Okay, cool. Well, I can't tell you how much you should charge. I'm, I'm working on a video right now where like, I'm going to kind of explain a rough way of explaining how to get your own pricing, but I can't tell you how to do that. There's so many variables, but I could tell you where to start. Uh, I can't tell you, I can't be there with you on set to set up your lighting, but I could tell you where to start, right? Um, there's so many things that I can't necessarily do for you, but I can give you starting points to learn that. Once you've taught that, then that, that person is going to find those things and grow. Um, and then you kind you're what you're doing is you're moving your content as a freelancer, rather either it's to a point that you're already at, or you're documenting as you're getting there because other people are farther behind you all the time. There's always going to be someone that's behind you. There's always going to be someone that's in front of you. And essentially what this channel is about and what the content, what I want it to be about is as I learn things, you learn things. There's stuff I know about the Sony Venice that like we learned at kind of the same time, technically, if you watch the video, um, those are things that you want to keep in mind, right? So if you are somebody in video production, there are people that are buying cameras that are more uh, accessible now that want to do the exact job that you're doing right now. And regardless if you feel ahead or you feel behind, 
somebody is behind you being like, for in Jay's example, Jay, I want to know how you're doing everything that you're doing. And I am willing to sit through hours of you telling me about it. Um, and much so if you have any recommendations on what I need and some things that help you out, I want to buy those things. So those are things that you could, you could help. Uh, those are ways that you could help, right? Initially, and, and a lot of times in the video production side of social media, you're going to be on the educational side of things. So the whole thing is always keep the fact that you're edu educating at the, the foundation of your content. Um, hey, brother, any concern with the coming changes to the way YouTube shows ads in your videos? Uh, no, not exactly. I feel like, hang on a second. You know what? I'm going to think about this big brain. Um, it creates more pressure to make good videos people want to watch. Because what ends up happening is that if I want to watch that, if I want to watch Cam's Red Komodo X review, I don't know if Cam's still here. If I want to watch that, I'm going to sit through those ads. Or I'm going to get premium, whatever, whichever one comes first. Uh, if you make videos that people want to watch or you think has the highest amount of value to somebody else, people are going to sit through ads. Like I have tons of videos and some of them are super long and I'm sure a bunch of them have ads on them, um, but they still have pretty decent watch times because people want that information. They're willing to sit through those things to have them happen. It's like watching TV. If I want to watch uh, what happens during, I almost ruined JJK. If I want to watch what is happening in a particular anime uh, and I want to see it to the end, but there's a commercial, but I also don't want to pay for the premium, then I'm going to sit through those Crunchyroll ads, right? So it, it does put a little bit of pressure on the creator to actually make videos people want to see uh, because there's going to be more ads on there. What's a good video and how do you define it? Uh, I think my litmus test for a good video is did I create a promise and did I deliver on the promise? That's about it. If I say um, the video that's coming out next week is going to be how to start your filmmaking career on the Sony FX30, as long as I deliver on that promise as best I possibly can, then how the distance between presenting the promise and answering it, that's how I define good, right? If I'm way off and I'm not giving out good information or the information's un un understand, like you can't understand it, um, or I'm spinning it off into a sales pitch, then it's not good content. But if I've made a promise to the audience by putting up the title and thumbnail, and then I've delivered on the content, then it's a good video. Uh, I keep ads on now because I'm trying to do commercial filmmaking. I usually never see any commercial work. Yeah, so I think uh, I keep the ads on now because I'm trying to do commercial filmmaking, and I usually never see any commercial work. The hard part with commercial work is it kind of depends on like what sector of commercial work uh, you're in. Um, for me personally, like I don't know if fitness commercial work counts as commercial work, man. It's it's a video service for the for the perspective of trying to sell a good or a service. That's essentially a commercial in my eyes. Now, does that mean I'm going to be working with thirty person sets with tons of budget? No. Um, but I think the hard part with that, I think that's the the tough part, right? Is like finding those people. I think as somebody like and this is where i'm trying to go to more generalist commercial stuff is i got to start shooting and th this might be something for you guys uh start dressing for the job you want to get paid for so essentially i'm gonna have to start shooting certain commercials of jobs that i want to get it's a little bit tedious it takes a lot of resources but uh, if you're gonna get into commercial production they're kind of specific in terms of who they go with and most of the times it's production companies so like you could either uh, present what you can offer to a production company or you start your own, to be honest with you. Bro, your content advice is so fire. I'm waiting. That's actually perfect, man. Kim, that, uh, Michael Kim, sorry. Um, Kim, oh my God, I can't read. Uh, that's super dope, man. I'm, I'm really trying to work on a outreach kind of product. Uh, I think I'm going to put pitch decks in there as well for people that don't, um, that don't have them. So, I don't know. That, that's a product I want to work on, but also super congratulations to you for actually sending that proposal. And um, one thing I would recommend for you is once you send it, uh, look up the competitors that are in that same industry and send it to them as well. Because if you got to the proposal phase with one company, you might get to it with other people as well. Uh, downloading the ad blocker extension to Chrome, which works with YouTube, just a tip. So you have the option to skip ads. Don't know if that hurts the creator though. Uh, it definitely does hurt the creator farm productions. If you have an ad blocker, I think that was a point of the, uh, going anti ad blocker on YouTube is it does hurt creators in their ad sense and stuff like that. Um, cause a lot of people like the way like that they're only, um, reward, I guess, for putting out these videos and spending hours and editing and filming and stuff like that was AdSense sometimes instead of the affiliate market. So when people used ad blockers, it actually kind of screwed a lot of people. 
Um, and I think the and it also hurts the platform as well. So it's not just a YouTube wants the money thing, but because YouTube does a I think a near fifty percent ad revenue split with the creator. If you have an ad blocker to block from YouTube, you're also hurting the creator that's getting another fifty percent. Um, facts about what I'm doing right now. Why are you so based? What's pop in there in your area uh right now it is rainy it's cold it's a it's like half slow half fast i mean in the the corporate production world i think it's coming to the end of some people's quarters so like they're gonna start spending money on advertisement i'm not super versed in there i kind of i don't know this whole youtube thing is like shaking up uh where i want to put my a lot of my video production efforts so um it's going it's working but we're gonna get to winter where it's super super cold and people don't want to do much has being a part of AOD helped you in your YouTube game? Do you see increased people coming to watch your videos through connections there? Um, no. Yes. No? Not really. Um, AOD was really great. Actually, I, I see Mark in a couple hours. It's like three hours. Um, but AOD, what, what it helped in the, uh, the create and earn, I think is what you're referring to. Um, I have a, a, a short course in the create and earn part of things. It helped give a little bit of clarity and recontextualize how I looked at YouTube. But that was essentially more or less the only conversation that we really had about it. Um, and then I just took the ground running and just started doing my own thing. Now, in terms of do I think it increased the viewership and stuff? Not really. I don't think so. Um, to be honest, I'll attribute a lot of that to me just being like, hey, I'm going to put out a, a stupid amount of volume and then and kind of double down on things that work and not do the things that don't. Uh, but there is a sense of a lot of AOD students are now following the channel. It kind of like works both ways. Like, um, it's not such a big jump from one to the other from just being in that in that course but a lot of people that are now in AOD are like oh well Kofi's there too so I'm going to watch some of the stuff that he has to offer that's inside of the course as well so it kind of works a little bit both ways but I, I wouldn't say like it turns subscribers and stuff like that like a gigantic um attribution was that um what do you think about building an audience through short form content on Instagram Reels before making YouTube videos? Is it better to make long form video? Now, uh, Andrea, short form video is great as an outreach thing because people will see it, they'll see value from it, they'll comment, they'll like on it. Hard part is, and you could grow a really big short form audience, hard part is the monetization aspect. There's not a lot of monetization behind short form stuff. Um, I speak from two sides of my mouth because I've done some paid uh, short form content pieces before, but it's not nearly as good as YouTube. Now, that being said, I think the answer is yes and both. So if you can, if you have the capacity for short form content, make short form content, like making short form content is better than not making anything at all. However, it also makes a, um, it makes it easier to make long form stuff as well because you have that practice behind camera, even if it's in a short capacity. The second thing is that you might want to consider what you can do to use YouTube in that um, in order to generate revenue on both sides. I think Google did or something uh, block a YouTube won't work if you don't remove it. No. Yeah, that's kind of what happened, right? Um, Yeah, that's the. I think the the idea with like the YouTube ad blocker things. I think they're just not gonna be like, hey, you can't just come for free, paying nothing, or anything like that. Uh, I struggle so much with finding time to plan, film, edit YouTube videos in the midst of busy project schedules. How do you manage this? Seems like you have a lot of projects, but keep cranking videos. Um, I have retainer clients, so like it makes it easier for me to kind of schedule time and stuff like that. And I've only I'm not that's a lie. I haven't only been doing retainer work. I've been doing other freelance work. I just do I do far less freelancing now than I did uh, when I first started YouTube, which kind of helps out with like planning and shooting and editing these videos. But I will offer this to you in a little bit of a, a, a challenge. I don't take it as sarcasm or anything like that. But if you're as busy as you are, you have the resources to outsource part of the production of YouTube videos. So that was one of the things that I acknowledged as well, where I was freelancing so much and I wanted to make a lot of YouTube content. Then I realized, I'm like, well, if all this money's coming in because you're so busy, pay an editor, right? And that's something that you could look at doing, right? You could have somebody that's off uh, that's off the channel that's editing those videos. So while you're working on your freelance stuff, your YouTube videos are already taken care of and you could start to offset the stuff that you don't have time for or stuff that you're not good at. Um, how do you find creators to collab with? Let's say colors, camera, DPs, real, like, well, my man, there's no way to, there's a way to go nowhere. Um, Natalia, what I would recommend for you is to be uh, an incredibly good resource for whatever you're doing and then you offer that in exchange for what you want someone else to do only when you find something called a mutual benefit 
uh, equation, I guess, is where you're going to be able to do a lot of collabs that are super meaningful. Because what ends up happening is that if you want to collab on something, but somebody else is open to it, but like the exchange doesn't happen where they're not getting the skills that they don't have, and you're providing skills that they don't need, then what ends up happening is you might collab once or twice, but then you'll never end up working with each other because only one person is getting what they want out of that deal. Have you have you have interest in Hallmark Christmas movies? Uh, maybe, I don't actually know. I'm actually gonna spend Christmas in Africa. So um, it, even if I did, it might not look the way that you think it is. Uh, I haven't been back to Ghana since I was 19 and I'm 31 now. So it's been a, quite a long time. So I'm gonna like, basically what's happening with the channel right now and i'll give you guys a sneak peek but i have like 18 videos that i think i'm going to do for the rest of the year uh and i'm already done nine of them so um once that's done i'm taking a break i'm going to be gone i'm going to be in ghana for a little bit and um that's what's going to happen so christmas maybe maybe i'll do a hallmark christmas movie it just everyone will be african and there won't be any snow um totally makes sense i appreciate your grind you do great work man i joined aod after watching you and mark oh thank you man that's uh that actually that goes a long way in fact i i quite literally am going to help him with some sort of secret project giveaway whatever's happening i don't really know but he needs me to help him with some stuff for it and uh he's walking distance away so it's fun um the last month i had my first viral short any recommendation how to convert views and better next um the thing with viral shorts and it's I, i'm not a good short form person i'll be honest with you um the only thing i could think of is think of other videos that are related to the thing that made it go viral or like really start to analyze what made the video go viral and try to repeat it um sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't so it does become a bit tough but i uh I do think that if uh, success leaves clues, right? And I think that was from Sean Cannell. But um, whatever made it go viral, there's something about it that hooks somebody in. So it might be something you want to try. Also, depending on where you went viral, sometimes short form platforms will like test um, certain types of content in certain areas. So there's no real rhyme or reason as to why some things happen. But I don't know how accurate that is, like given today. Uh, I am I I I'm, I love goat. Goat is actually one of my favorite meats. But uh, I guess uh, thanks for that. Uh, I think you do well, Kofi. Thank you. Uh, I think I do okay. I think I do pretty well. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to do this YouTube thing and also do as much freelancing as possible. But I do need to do both, or I have nothing to teach you guys. Um, it ripped off on TikTok and Instagram, but I'm still not sure why. Evan, I would just that's a tough one. I I think. Try making a part two of it. Try making like an alternate version of it and see how it works. Um, maybe it's the hook. Maybe it's how long it took. Maybe the pacing. Like try a bunch of different things. The hard part with viral stuff is they never tell you why. I was in Ghana last month, bro. Make sure you pay us a visit up in Morocco. I wish I could uh, move around a little bit more within the continent. Um, but I have so many family members that I haven't seen that I'm like, I should. I, I don't know if I have enough time. I'm only going to be there for about three and a half weeks. Um, seeing family and stuff like that. I'm probably gonna use the false color from Caleb Pike and it works really well on the FX30. Don't really need a monitor anymore for smaller projects. Hey man, if it works, bro, it works. Caleb's also a homie of the channel. Uh, me and him have been talking about doing uh, a collab regarding the FX30, which is gonna be really cool if we can get it going. Um, should you monetize as soon as possible or build a decent audience first? This includes charging for things like user guides and Patreons. Um, Here's where I'm at with monetization, and this is where you guys kind of see this on the channel as well. Um, I like creating a lot of value so much so that if I do ask or do sell anything, it's almost irresponsible to say no. Um, the reason why, like, and the reason why I want to do that, and the reason why I'm like loafing on courses, or I haven't made more digital products, or I'm just bad at digital products in general in terms of promoting them, is because I want to make sure that I have a foundation of like information I've given everybody beforehand. Now, in terms of yourself, in terms of monetizing and stuff like that, um, I think there's like there's different types of monetization. Things that are more passive, like affiliate marketing, I don't think it's too bad. I don't think it's wrong to start that off early. Uh, especially when you're talking about things that you're recommending to people, that's fine. I think that's very natural. Um, digital products and courses and stuff like that, I would say build up a little bit more. The reason why is because you don't want to go into something and then have people kind of dismiss it because they think you're just trying to peddle something to them to sell. For, to sell. Um, try to establish a little bit of rapport before actually starting to sell things that they have to go off the platform or go to somewhere that they would normally not go to based on the recommendation. So like if I normally go on Amazon to buy camera gear, if you recommend something on Amazon, I'm probably going to go there. But if you recommend your digital products on your website, well, for what other reason would I go to your website otherwise to buy your digital product, right? So you want to keep that in mind. 
Um, even conduct that isn't directly towards clients, would you you would like to serve? We could ensure that they will trust and provide. Them. Um, I guess this one's about like how your clients will trust, even if it's not necessarily content that um that they that they they're looking for. Um, I will say that in my kind of YouTube journey, I've actually gotten a lot of gigs from my YouTube, and not even necessarily from finished products, but just being able to articulate the process behind the things that I'm doing. There was a sense of trust of like, hey, I know I've not seen it, for example, a music video from this guy, but um. I trust that he is confident enough to be on set and to know what he's doing. So in terms of your content, don't necessarily think that you only are going to get client projects from finished products. Um, because for the most part, I, I still don't get client projects from finished stuff. It's usually the behind the scenes. It's usually the YouTube stuff where I get a lot more trust from people because it's not necessarily the finished product. They're more inquiring about whether or not can I trust this person to do the job. Um, and also acknowledging that like I haven't done the exact job that they're looking for because it would have already happened. A guy who's interested in some, some sports documentaries with more niche sports. A guy who links on rock climbing or ultimate frisbee. Yo, honestly, uh, yes. Uh, I think I just was talking to my buddy Ryan, who was my sound recordist for a project that we just kind of were playing around with the Venice with. And uh, we're going to do trampoline, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I got one with a ex professional football player on Sunday, um, but I want to get into some like weird stuff. I don't know. There's something about like doing weird sports and doing docs like short docs and weird sports. It'll be super funny. Um, Three point five weeks. You're lucky if you have two point five of that on your own. Since you mentioned some family, yeah, I I probably won't. I think the only scapegoat that I have is that my girlfriend's coming with me. So like. If she decides that she doesn't want to go and see all my family members, like my family is going to be like, oh, okay, we're not going to stress out this person because we want her to like us. So that's going to be like my kind of catch all if I want to get time to myself is like she's going to be the person to pull me out of that. So I've been behind the camera for years, but diving into personal branding on YouTube, bro, any tips or sorry, any pro tips or shifts in minds that you recommend connecting to viewers on your platform? Uh, Charlie, uh, you actually asked this on Instagram and I wanted to answer that. I was getting to the Instagram questions after this last one, but, um, one of the things I would recommend is your personal brand, especially like the overarching mindset that I, at least I have with YouTube and, and personal content is it's made to help somebody who's not in the same position as I am be in that position. So what, what, every time I put something out, the idea is, I, yes, obviously there's monetary stuff. Obviously you want people to buy products and whatever the case is. But the idea is I want to be able to teach something, someone something at the end of the day. So that should be the foundation and the driving force of a lot of the content you want to put out as a personal brand. Now, as a personal brand, and a brand generally is just going to be your reputation to the audience and what they know you for. So if you are a particular type of videographer or filmmaker in a certain space, you can still teach and be a service to people just teaching that particular style because one, it's something you enjoy, excuse me, and two, you're giving value back to people. I think what ends up happening is when you're starting out, people don't don't know who you are. So you have to give them a reason to A, know who you are, and B, to actually care about the things you're talking about, which often becomes you giving a lot more than what you're taking, right? So instead of me putting out project after project and, and on the channel and kind of flexing what my skill set is, I would spend 112 videos saying, hey, I, I worked on this thing and here's how you do it. So you want to bring people in on stuff that solves their problems um, rather than just showing off your skill set. But in terms of the personal branding, like, being consistent with your messaging, right? Like my big thing is I always talk about education. I will we'll talk about gear, but I talk about gear from the perspective of not necessarily trying to sell you, but just telling you what it does. And if you want to buy it, go for it. Those things are also part of your personal brand because that also goes into the reputation that you hold with the audience. Uh, I don't, I've actually only mentioned shooting fitness content, maybe in three videos. Most people know me for shooting fitness content by watching my videos, right? So there's a consistency in the style in which you teach certain things. So you want to keep those things in mind. How consistently are you saying certain things? Um, the style in which you do say those things. And a lot of that's going to take up the bulk of how you do your personal branding. Um, but also like stuff that you want to provide to the audience, right? Like I'm going to do live streams every single week. And that's going to be part of the personal brand where if you have questions, that's where it's going to be, right? And it's also going to be things you say no to. Like, 
uh, I find, and some of you guys might, might know this, I find Instagram DMs really hard to answer all the time because one, it, I don't get notifications, and two, sometimes there's a lot of them, and uh, it gets overwhelming answering those, and then also doing this stuff, and then filming and editing. So I just I do things on live streams or AMAs and stuff. So your your personal brand is the style of which you present, but then also the context of how you're presenting as well. Uh, do you think if you're building your own brand, should your YouTube channel grow your name and be your own name? Uh, here's my thing, Young Humanity, because I I think the growth of this channel happened uh, actually after a name change. So for me, when I started uh, doing video production in general, uh, I went under the uh, KY the Creative. Uh, and that was just my initials because saying Kofi Eboa for some people was incredibly difficult. And also just growing up, I had a history of people getting my name wrong. Um, and I kept doing that to help people pronounce my name properly, but then end up getting called Kai all the time, which really got on my nerves. So um, I was kind of confused as to where I was going to go with it. So two things happened. One, um, I had a consult with YC Imaging one time, and we were talking about the same topic. Um, and he was talking about the idea where you want to make your personal branding name what people are going to call you in public, mostly because like on social media, most people don't know who you are. So it becomes tough to know what your like real name is or to call you by your real name if I only know you by your social media. Um, and my dad said something else after that and he's like, if people can say Arnold Schwarzenegger correctly, people can say Kofi Boa correctly, right? And part of that mismatch is when you create a big impact on somebody, people will make it a point to say your name properly. So I changed my name to, like, well, I didn't change my name, I just reverted it back to what my actual name is. Um, nah, bro, your GIF will have to cave to you. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, my my dad is more inclined to tell her how the trip is going to go and, like, adjust things to make her happy than me. And it's hilarious because I'm like, bro, I'm your son. What are you doing, bro? This guy, this guy told, like, I know what's going on during this trip because my dad told my girlfriend and not me, which is hilarious. Um, I think I answered all the questions. I answered all the questions in the chat. I haven't got through all the YouTube ones yet. We're still trying to get through the 10 YouTube questions, and there is one, two, three, four. There are four more. This curriculum thing, out the window. Um, do you recommend putting your portfolio work on the channel or keep it somewhere separate? Uh, I think you can do both. I, I think one thing you want to do is, again, we talked about this. You want to have a healthy mix of you flexing your skill set, but then also teaching people how to flex theirs. That can go a super long way. Um, if I got an FX30 and I shoot the base of the so I still get a lot of noise while shooting. Oh, this is just somebody that says, please make sure there's more uh, FX30 tutorials on your channel. There is going to be a ton. I think something that's going to happen in the future is uh, I'm going to shoot a lot more with the FX30 and then the jobs that I do, the Red Komodo X or the Raising the Rad Raptor or the Barana, which we're shooting on, I think, next week. Um, I'm just going to make those BTS vlogs and they're not going to necessarily take the forefront of the channel. Uh, I have 5.7 subs and 100 music videos, but want to change over the to broader content creation, video and audio production. Do you think the transition can work? Absolutely. I think as long as the content is still necessarily in the same vein as what you've already put out, then you might not lose too many of your subscribers. But at the same time, like if you've only been putting up 100 music videos, like 100 finished music videos, perhaps content about how to make those music videos might also be uh, super valuable because if someone's watching a hundred more videos of how you go about music videos, then there's actual like um, examples of how you've done everything you're talking about. Right. So uh, keep that in mind too. So if, it, if it's still in the same vein, then keep it on the same channel. But if it's not, I would say move it to something new. Do you create contract to attract more ideal customers or do you make content to educate other video producers? That's always been my hang up. Uh, oh, I mean, music production. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's fine. I think, I think what you got to do um, is take the content from your living room and put it into somebody else's. So, uh, as long as you are making content about how the viewer can do that thing, over time you'll actually garner a big audience because people always come back to a resource that they can use. So, as long as you are giving out a resource, I think it's fine. Do you ever think there will be a merit? in shorter YouTube videos to avoid extra mid-roll ads now that they're unskippable? Good question. I think there is, but I think the hard part with the reason why shorter YouTube videos don't do so well is because uh, there's a thing called your relevant retention graph. 
And what ends up happening is that when you put out shorter videos, you are competing immediately with every other video that's the same length. And the amount of shorter YouTube videos, there's millions of those in comparison to longer YouTube videos. And I think that's why um, podcasts have done long or like super long form content does really well is because when the algorithm is pushing that to other people, whatever the case is, or it's pulling people, I guess, to the content, I should say, it's pulling people that like that type of content or watch that type of stuff, right? So you want to keep that in mind. Short YouTube videos are great. Um, I don't know if it's going to change very much because of the algorithmic competition with so many videos that are there. Which ones do you pull an audience to when there's 2 billion five-minute videos, but there's 17 one-hour videos, right? Could help you out with the FX37. I've filmed a lot of stuff. Hey, STM, put that stuff up on the internet. Like if you, I mean, if you're if you're coming in here for the title, then... Throw that up on uh, throw it up on the YouTube and, and start showing people what, uh, how they can also get the most out of that camera too, man. Also, Lay Love Lockhart keeps people on for longer. That makes a lot of sense too. But I also would say, like, how many Netflix? Here's my argument for that: is how many Netflix shows do you watch that are two minutes long? You probably like, you know what I mean? If you if you like something, you'll stay in it for as long as you can. So it's not even just like the YouTube algorithm. And we were talking to the. Um, the YouTube liaison while we were in condo. The algorithm doesn't push content, it pulls people. So a lot of the times, the stuff that does well is stuff that are based on people's behavioral habits, right? So for example, like prank content. I'm sure nobody wants to see it like in everyday life, uh, like in person. I mean, maybe less people, I don't know. But what ends up happening is that based on the behaviors of a viewer, that they'll get pulled into a certain realm of content. So if I go to my homepage right now in, in YouTube, most of it's not other filmmaking content creators, which would make sense for being pushed content. Uh, most of my stuff is on the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the case going on with Jonathan Majors, unfortunately, right now. Um, I'll get pulled into that stuff because it's based on my viewing behaviors and not necessarily push something because it thinks that I like something, if that makes any sense. Uh <sighs> Oh, I didn't answer the question of do I attract more uh, content to educate other people or, or for clients. Um, both, man. I think I think if you're making content in the filmmaking space, you can do stuff to bring more co uh, clients, which actually could be making stuff for other video producers as well. Like you could actually hit two birds with one stone there. Like for example, I share a ton of. Uh, stuff about gear and behind the scenes and all that other stuff but that brings in clients because they're like hey this person knows what he's talking about but it also brings in other people in video production because they're like hey i'm interested in this and this person sounds like he knows what he's talking about so you actually can do both by hitting by doing one piece of content you could actually satisfy two audiences um how do you get over creative blocks how do you deal with projects that aren't either aren't yours and most proud of and have issues producing um for one, if you haven't noticed, a lot of stuff I've done for other clients, I'm not super, super hyped on, so they just don't make it to this channel. Uh, but there's always something I like about it, and those are the things I focus on. So in terms of like dealing with creative blocks, one thing I also did was I pre-planned a lot of stuff I wanted to do on YouTube for a while. So everything that you're seeing as it's happening now, the vast majority of those videos, I planned and wrote down the ideas in December 2022. Um, and I'm just executing on those ideas. And because I haven't hit that threshold of that earlier number, we said about 700 videos for hundred thousand subs. Um, I don't feel like I've hit the threshold to worry about whether or not the channel is growing or not, because I haven't hit the minimum amount of work that the average person has to get to. And until that, I'm not worrying too much about it. I'm just going to create an idea, execute on the idea and go from there. Uh, would you consider doing series-based content? Uh, what do you mean by that? Like series based on like a particular topic? Uh, I'm actually gonna start doing that now. It might just be, um, I mean like in terms of like educational YouTube content, I'm gonna do that with the FX30 to be honest with you. Um, I think the hard part is, is that I picked the worst season to try to like rehash my freelancing career and teach it back because we're getting into the time where it's the most dead. Um, so I might just be, it might just be videos on like kind of a tutorial style, uh, talking head kind of thing. But uh, let me know more about this uh, series type stuff that you speak of. I am curious. Um, I'm gonna try to get into the Instagram questions. How do you get opinions from your content? How do you know that it's a good content or bad talking in more creative projects? Like, 
Oh, the same the same way, like the way that I uh, I get opinions about my content, the same way I get opinions about YouTube stuff. I just ask people who have something that I want. Like one thing that I try to steer away from is I don't like, or not necessarily don't like, I take a lot of unsolicited opinions with a grain of salt. Um, and I take more seriously the opinions of people that are either mentors of mine or people I look up to or people in the same place. Um, as regards to like content now in terms of like commercials my client is going to tell me what's good and what's not because they're the one paying me so like they're the only opinion that matters but in terms of like my own personal stuff uh i have like my own kind of like group of people that i bounce ideas off of and stuff like that because at the end of the day if it's not client work and the client's the one that's paying you and their opinion's the one that matters uh, my opinion could not matter because that's not the thing that's going to that's going to complete the job and that's the thing that's my distance with client work it's if it's not mine it's not mine uh, my personal work, I will ask people that are closer around me because they actually care about who I am and, and they'll give me either the tough love that I need or the, they'll give me more of, they'll give me more of what I'm looking for. If I leave it up to the general population, you might get someone who's having a bad day and decides to take it out on you in the comment section. And honestly, that's a lot of the time. So I just don't listen to those opinions. Oh, okay. The Ryan, yeah. So the Ryan Trahan series is exactly what I want to start with the FX30, and um, I want to build that up into a Sony Burano. I don't know why I want to do this, and I think it's a stupid idea when I think about it, but I want to do it anyways. So um, yes, that's uh, those those type of series I really do want to try. I'm just thinking of how to do that, but still maintain some of the regular content that I have going on already. Also, with series type content, like it has to be the only thing I'm doing, which is kind of hard for me mentally to. Uh, to wrap my head around, I, I don't like only doing like one thing for a long period of time. I like to try a couple things. Um, Lewis Potts also uh, was a creator that started in the pandemic, and I think a lot of the pandemic content operates on a completely different set of rules than right now. Um, I also met Lewis Potts. He was in Toronto. He was a super nice dude. Um, it's really hard to find out what it's really hard to find out like what makes a lot of the content that happened in 2020 uh, do so well outside of the idea that like a ton of people have the ability to watch it. So I try not to like, I try not to analyze something that isn't under the same circumstances. There was way more people on YouTube as a platform back then. Um, but now in 2023, like I would rather do a case study on another creator that started at the same time as I did. That's here now. Um, Yeah, I could plan it for the future and, and try to do it that way. That'd be really cool. Uh, don't be a guest in my podcast. We discuss freelance gear, social media. Can keep up the good work. Uh, yeah, man, send me a email or a DM on Instagram. Uh, podcasts are always fun. Um, I will be gone for the first half of November, so it might be touchy. So if you're if you're down for the second half of November, Alberto, let me know. Um, just because I'll be shooting nonstop pretty much from November the first till the fifteenth. Uh. During COVID, his views were on, yeah, like, like that's, that's to the same thing, right? Like if you have a channel that uh, gained a lot of traction during a time where there was a lot of people watching, it's it's far easier to, to do those things. But um, from knowing Lewis Potts and stuff like that too, I think he has a, uh, and, I, and I've talked to him about this too, he has more of a audience in a very particular niche where everyone shares that type of stuff. And because he answers to the people that are shooting on Ari's and shooting feature films and stuff like that, it's not quite the same. As a lot of other filmmaking creators, I think he has a certain department of people and he has all of those people because there's not a lot of people offering that type of information. So, um, again, it's super hard to do a case study on something that doesn't have the same circumstances. Those are pretty tough. And at the end of the day, I think the easiest way to make a solution on that is just put up more stuff that's valuable to people. Um, yeah, man, let me know. Hit me up. That'd be cool. Uh, Ricardo, thank you. No problem. Um also, in answering these questions, sometimes I don't read the name and I read the question and then I don't know when someone says thank you what the question they answered, but it is what it is, whatever. Uh, uh, here's, in, in 180, I don't, I, I'm only saying this because it's just the way my brain works. The way that I look at somebody doing well is kind of the same way that Kendrick Lamar looks at other rappers when he did the control verse, where I, I love that they do those things, but I think for, for the most part, the answer that I come down to when I look at like a Lewis Potts or Mark Bone or, or Danny or whatever, as I look at them, I'm like, okay, cool. Just put your own ass in gear, right? Um, instead of trying to like find out exactly what it is or what the X factor is, I'm just like, it usually always comes down for me at least is, okay, work harder. 
And uh, that's what it comes down to. So I, I kind of like I look at it. I'm like, that's cool. Uh, go back to work because at the end of the day, that's usually going to be the answer. Once you start using stills cameras for stills work and video cameras for video work, your life gets easier. Uh, I, I I get it. Uh, I I enjoy the sentiment, but at the same time, people coming up, especially in this economy, sometimes don't have money for both cameras. Um, but one thing would be to work your way up into a part where you do have a camera just for video and a camera just for photography. Um, and a lot of people do that after over time. But I think for people that are just kind of um, – that kind of just rolling into this sometimes only have enough money for one camera and, and want to have one lens. Um, but yeah, like, like a lot of these things and a lot of guys coming in here are coming from experience and stuff like that and offering that experience. Um, but I think for people that are rolling into filmmaking and rolling into YouTube and stuff like that, um, start somewhere uh, and, and and work your way up from there. And if that's the route you want to go, go for it, man. Um, hybrid stuff is really necessary for a lot of creators, especially artists. Yeah. Kind of the same thing that Solo Sam said, right? Like, yes, a dedicated photo camera, dedicated video camera, absolutely, positively, those are great things to do. You always want to, like, having somebody that is specialized in one thing is way better than having one person that specialized in many things or kind of half pregnant on, on many things. Um, but at the same time, someone ha you have to start somewhere, right? And and the, the efforts of being more educational than telling people the answer to their problems is to buy more stuff start somewhere work your way up that's the easiest way to explain it um i just realized your monetization off on this whole video awesome um i'm trying to think of any other questions I, I went a straight hour 23 did not go to one part of my notes and just answered questions which is hilarious but um hey it is what it is we the live stream was to try to answer specific questions um that is a recommendation that i want to give to you guys as well as when you are making your content uh, be specific in the questions you're answering and think of um, think of the person that is on the other end. And I think one thing that a lot of people kind of forget is that if you make content and you're not thinking about the people that are watching it, then people aren't going to want to watch those things, right? Um, and sometimes even I do that, right? Like sometimes when I talk about like using the Sony Venice a bunch and using the Red Komodo, I lose track of the fact that like, yes, is that informational in some things that are a little bit more uh, higher production, to, so to speak. But also at the same time, if you can't see yourself in those areas or if I can't bridge that gap for you better than what I have been, then those people aren't going to feel like they're in good company when information is being given. So uh, if I was to, like, if I was to offer like an overarching thing in terms of a mindset for YouTube, always keep in mind of the person that's on the other side of the screen. Uh, I just want to say thank you for your insights. And I send you the. Oh, that's awesome, man! Uh, thank you. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about in terms of the workflow and making a lot more videos for YouTube and just making it easier for you is. Um, batch recording man that's the big thing that's like saved a lot of uh what i wanted to do when i wanted to put out a high output for the year is this might take a little bit of um this might take a lot of time but what i want you want to do is you want to take a couple of days to ideate what you want your channel to be around and like what things you're good at and what things you want to teach other people step one now step two is um you want to be able to compartmentalize those into different ideas for videos and then what you want to do is you want to pull up a couple of those videos and try to keep them as like relatable as possible and then shoot the A roll for those videos, cut them up on the day that they are, add the title to the day that they are because it's very easy to do. You could cut up footage, you could add titles, you don't have to put B roll in just yet and then just have those and sit on those. Then what's gonna end up happening, especially if you're freelancing still actively, while you have those things that you're teaching, Oftentimes, the things that you're going to be teaching are things that you already do or things that you've already done. So either by way of having BTS, finished products, or actually when you do have um, stuff coming up, while you're doing the things you're teaching, that becomes your B-roll for these projects. So that way, all you have to do when you've shot a project is drag and drop the very thing you're talking about and then put that into the video project. Get your thumbnail and you're good to go. That's what I've done the entire year. I would talk about things that I, I know I'm going to do certain things every single project. So... I get the BTS of that while it's happening, and then I just take that B-roll of me explaining it instead of having to like go and make a whole other shoot and then do it that do it that way. So you think mine the typical YouTube content consumer thing? Yeah, loud and clear. Like that's that's the that's a big thing that even 
like I lose track of sometimes, and that's why I want to go a little bit more on the FX30 side of things, is that like the people that are watching uh, YouTube videos are looking to learn something or be entertained, right? And the farther along you go, the less things you feel like you have to learn, right? So you're not going to get a seasoned video production company that's going to go to YouTube to figure something out as often as you would somebody who picked up a camera because it's cheap and they don't really know what's going on. Um, but also a way that you could circumvent that if that's the content you want to put out is that you bring people along with you, right? Like the way that I'm trying to do this, uh, the angle of this channel now is I'm bringing, I, I want to get everybody up into speed in terms of a beginning freelancer with their camera and stuff like that, bring them up to a certain level to right where just, just before where I am right now, and then everything else is a documentation. But I find what ends up happening with a lot of people that go from um, video production to YouTube is they start off where they're already at, which confuses most people because there's like anywhere between four and 10 years before that. And everybody else is like, that's cool. I don't know how to do that, right? So those are things you wanna keep in mind. Now, give me one second. I have to go and get my laptop charger. I thought I'd be done by now. All right, there you go. We're charged. We're good to go. How are you separated relationship of gear? Uh, Ricardo, uh, ask the question again because I'm a little confused of what you mean. Would you have some advice for shooting passion projects consistently? I find it very hard to say no to clients. And find uh, so, Andre, that's kind of the, uh, the situation I'm in right now. I spent so much time developing this YouTube thing and like sacrificing, I guess, essentially the ability to shoot passion projects and stuff like that for building the foundation of the business so I can get technically paid for doing passion projects. Um, one thing that I would recommend doing is like having multiple streams of income, really. I think that's one of the big things is if you are using YouTube as, as a way of making a little bit of income, then some of those client projects I'm sure you're taking on probably aren't paying you as much as you would like them to, where you could replace that with your affiliate marketing or you could replace that with like pretty much anything, right? Like the way that things are right now for me is um, I do some sponsored content so I don't have to take on client projects. So when I have passion projects, I'm not losing anything from a client perspective because either the passion project or some aspect of it is gonna be financially taken care of or I just don't wanna do $500 videos anymore. Like it is like one of those two things, man. Um, did I get everything? I don't know if I got everything. If I got everything and there's no other questions, I could sign off the stream. But if you guys have any uh, pressing questions, I will give you two minutes to uh, to ask them while I talk about batch recording. So I left it a little bit in the batch recording side of things, but essentially batch recording is you're shooting more than one video at a time and you're producing more than one video in a time in the post-production. So like uh, my batch recording workflow kind of goes as follows. So I did the ideation thing in the December. So I'm literally just saying, I'm gonna make a hundred ideas. I'm gonna execute on a hundred ideas. The next step that I do is I start batch recording the eight, uh, make notes for those videos, but batch record the A roll for those videos um, and make sure I have the titles, make sure everything's there. And then as I'm doing freelance projects, the things that I'm talking about doing are the things that I'm actually doing. Now, with reviews for certain pieces of gear, um, did you forget to pay the light bill but have a V-mount for your key? No, my V-mount battery's plugged in. Um, laptop charger was my was my room i'm off track <laughs> um but essentially what i'm doing is i'm planning and scripting up videos and then i'm doing the a roll for multiple videos at a time sometimes it's three sometimes it's um five videos in a row and then i'll make sure that i cut everything up until the point where i need extra footage and then once that's done i just go out and get it now this also might take you to not launch your channel or or a lot of things yet because you never want to always kind of be one in the hole and have to always fill up one video. Sometimes you want to do multiples and get ahead a little bit. But um, once you've done that and you've executed on all the ideas you've written down, then you can start doing things as they start to come up. Now, reviews are going to be a little bit different because 
you have to go and shoot with them first. Like you have to test them out and you have to do all those things to make sure that you're accurate. But there are certain things that are objectively going to be stuff you're going to know right away. So for example, like if I'm doing a review, I'll use this Irix lens again. Like this Irix lens, I know it's 45 millimeters. I know it's T1.5. I know it has a manual focus ring. I know it doesn't have autofocus. It's PL mount. I know, the, like I know those things already. So that could be stuff that you record beforehand and then you could cut to the footage side of things and the quirks and all that other stuff. But that doesn't necessarily change the fact that the technical specs of it, the physical attributes of it are there. Uh, the same thing happens with your camera, right? That's going to be able to do certain things. And then when you are shooting with it as you're testing it, and this is why sometimes reviews take a little bit, is you state the obvious and then you go into some of the nitty gritty, right? Uh, that satisfies the people that don't know what you're talking about and now they know what it is. Um, but then also you get to test those things too. Told you guys one eighty. 180 degree rule. Thank you, man. Uh, it's best for Sam. I feel like sometimes as a beginning filmmaker, I spend more time looking for gear reviews and learning about the craft itself, like lighting, camera movement, and how to find balance. Yeah, man. It's a it's an easy trap to fall into. Um, and what I, I guess what I would recommend is like, it's kind of tough because like to eliminate reviews in general or to remove people from being able to do that or to gatekeep who gets to do them and who doesn't creates a bigger problem than the gear reviews themselves. Um, I guess the only thing that I would do then is then look for videos that have techniques or look for creators that have certain techniques and stuff like that. And also ask those things of those creators. I find a lot of people say they're tired of gear reviews and they want to learn other things, but then suggest what things you want to learn or what things you're, you're confused about. Um, where the audience goes, the creators are going to follow, right? Like if I put a cinematic breakdown of a, of a certain shoot, most of the time people don't watch it. If I put a gear review out from that same shoot, everybody watches it. And YouTube is only a reflection of the viewing habits of certain uh, of the person of the audience. So I would say if you are looking for more things that aren't gear reviews then watching less gear reviews actually is the only answer that is the most fair, I guess, in a way. Um, because it becomes tough otherwise, right? Like the creators, are, the creators like myself are obviously running a business that is a for profit thing. Let me just autofocus there. Um, they're, they're running a business. So they're trying to solve as many problems as possible. And if there's a more positive reception on solving a certain problem that's around camera gear, to and then they make the technique video and those same people don't show up, then it becomes very difficult. Not saying you don't, I'm just saying that that's what happens, right? I, I have way more views on, on product reviews than I do on um, teaching stuff, like outside of like one video that did really well this year. Uh, Yeah, loud and clear, I am one of those people. I can track uh, more than video at a time, and it's actually a freak mutant skill that other people get really freaked out when they see me do it in person. Um, if you know anybody that went to condo, they can attest that I would I will quite literally sit down in a room in public while there's distractions everywhere, and I will rip out like Instagram reels out of the yin yang. I think I posted 11 from that weekend, um, and everyone got really freaked out watching me do it because I not a lot of things bothered me that time. Um, what's your favorite part about you making videos uh, for YouTube? Uh, my favorite part about making videos for YouTube truthfully is understanding, like is seeing in real time, the separation between, um, offsetting my revenue would have made freelancing and doing YouTube videos, to be honest with you. Like, I think watching that kind of like game of, Hey, this sponsored video is what you would have charged for a photo shoot last year. But this sponsored video is a little bit more fun and you get that freedom. I think that's my most favorite part. But also I like teaching a lot, to be honest with you. I think uh, coming to terms with the idea that like I am, I would honestly say I'm just as much of a teacher as I am into filmmaking. So and that comes from two things. Like one, it, had I never played uh, college sports or anything like that, I would have been a primary school math teacher. That's the only other program I applied to outside of business. Um, I think so. I think that comes out when I start doing YouTube stuff. And two, like, it's really cool going to in person events and a person that I don't know coming up and saying, like, hey, like, you taught me so many things about so much stuff. Um, I think that's a really cool thing. So that's kind of like the, my favorite part about like making YouTube videos, I think, is everything that happens after. Um, Uh, loud and clear, it depends on the type of gear that you use it for. Also, like, it also depends on, like, your, 
at least for me, it depends on like, um, I'm trying to think of the word for it. It depends on how much gear you've used for how long, because certain things start to get fast tracked for me. So like me understanding, like, like I keep referencing the Irix lenses because they're right beside my fingers, but like understanding like at what apertures, um, things are still sharp at, or like how it reacts when a certain light source comes in, like, because I have done that for so many other pieces of gear, the fast track of figuring that out takes me a lot shorter because I have like a thing that I look for all the time and then I can figure out what those things are. Um, at the same time, I find that like, there's two things. One, um, yeah, I, I think it, it does take a little while to, to know a piece of gear and stuff like that. I'm not gonna discount that. But also I find that people watching it kind of have a certain thing, like they have a certain, uh, checklist of things that they need to know and that everything else if it's specific and it's niche the kind of they i'm realizing they don't care um there are certain things where like i don't like about the fx6 or something like that and it was like super hyper niche and people were like i don't care about that thing where i'm like yeah but i used it for so long and i and i found this quirk and they're like okay um so there is a threshold there's a threshold of like how much you need to know versus how much the person is looking for um, and how do you intersect the two of those things to obviously fully flesh out something to do uh, a review as honest as possible, but then at the same time, um, again, we're, if, we're, if we're in the mind of making things for the viewer, like how many things are not deal breakers to that person? But also if you pick something up that like, if you pick something up that um, is something that is important or is something that isn't often talked about, I think I, think I encourage uh, figuring those, that th I think I encourage pointing those things out. Sorry, I had a brain fart there. Uh, so it kind of goes both ways. I think over time, uh, as you use a ton of gear, the things that you look for get a little bit fast track, but at the same time, using things for, for a while does does do it well. Also, like, uh, yeah, how should, how should speak, how have? yeah, like that's, those are things that like are, and again, you know what though? That also comes from the type of viewer that it is, right? Like if I am, we identify that people that are watching for the education are a little bit more beginner. Even if those, even if that, like what you just said about the speed light, even if that was true, those are things that might not be deal breakers to somebody that is interested. Therefore, they might not care about that thing in the first place. So like, for example, if I was starting off in photography, like I might not, and sometimes I don't, there's sometimes things that because I, I my, like kind of my history is like, I didn't have a lot of stuff kind of growing up or I don't know, I lived pretty middle class, but I didn't have access to everything. Like there are certain quirks about technology that I don't notice because they don't bother me, right? So some people might be like, uh, for the whole uh, Sony de uh, versus uh, Panasonic debate, uh, people are like, oh, like, don't you want 6K open gate? I'm like, no, nah, man, like made money using 4K. Like I don't, not a thing where I think that one camera's way, way better than the other one's trash because it doesn't do 6K open gate because I, I haven't needed it up until now, right? There's certain things where some of the quirks dependent on the person don't even matter because they're just happy to have the thing that solves the problem even if it's only 85% of the problem, um, which is way better than 0% of the problem. So I think that's also like stuff I keep in mind too. Like, and if there's something that I pick up like throughout the way and stuff like that, I just make YouTube shorts about it and I link it back to the original video. Um, because I also think one thing I want to keep in mind, especially as education people in, in the video production space, is that you don't have to be perfect. Um, you just have to give the information as honestly as you know. Like there's no um, there's no merit in hiding information in order to make a sale or a responsive video, which most people, and I'm gonna demystify that, most people that do sponsored stuff, like if they don't like something or it's really like blazingly bad, they just send it back. Like I, I've talked to so many different of the creators that are at that tier where they're getting a lot of sponsor stuff uh, regularly, most of them send it back or don't say anything at all if they have nothing good to say. So for that, it is what it is. But um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being wrong and there's nothing wrong with getting new information and changing your mind. So like people did even switch cameras uh, when their job tends to change because my freelance life in regards to filmmaking and doing this YouTube stuff changes every four months. So every time that happens, if I give a new information and there's a way to make it easier, I'm not, uh, emotionally attached to certain pieces of gear, nor does my change in that based on my own lifestyle mean that somebody else has to make that decision also, especially if they're not in the same boat. So I um, hope that made a ton of sense. I, I tried my best to, to make sense there, but uh, I will leave almost, hang on, three, two, one. I'll leave one minute on the clock in case anybody has any extra questions. I 
still have to batch record videos, ironically enough. Uh, I got to get some photos done, and I box at seven? I don't know. I box tonight. So uh, if anyone has any other questions, feel feel free to ask. I can answer them. But uh, outside of that, I will depart after that. Uh, it's super funny. I have a, a group chat with Armando and Cam, and I haven't watched i haven't like read a single message and i think they're talking about something and it's been vibrating the entire time you guys can't hear it but um yeah when the group chat is, is lit uh all right i don't think anyone has any other questions uh we ended off with 33 people i don't know how many we started at but it's not important but thank you guys so much uh listening to this video about how to use youtube uh, as a filmmaker um i had an original curriculum at first but uh tends to be a lot of guys just had questions they ask and uh, i try to answer them as best i can so um with that i'm gonna start to sign off i think there's one more thing here i get attached to some gear but it has a special i've never saw i never saw them without it. i take a part of making something artistic and like you for life you have to uh yeah man uh, however you want to use gear is however you want to use it my thing i have generally no attachment to it. I buy something, sell something. Sometimes I buy the thing back again if I need it. Um, whatever is going to be there to help you with either your YouTube content or your filmmaking, don't use somebody else's possible perception of you as a way by which to, a way by which to make those decisions. So that's what I could leave you guys with. But um, in terms of creating your own YouTube channel, for the most part, a lot of us are video producers. We can make our own videos. Uh, batch record stuff and talk about things you already know because that's gonna be valuable to somebody else coming in. Um, and use the streams of income like affiliate marketing, sponsorships we might talk about in a later video. It's probably a longer conversation. But um, yeah, man, that's pretty much all I got for you. So uh, if you like this video, make sure you like it. I don't know, throw a like down there. Don't really know if it changed anything, but um leave i'll make a community post about what you want to guys see or what you guys want to see in the next video but i'm signing off here peace